Hi there, it's a common magician. I want to try something with you real quick. I have a deck of cards here. I'm going to look away, but I would have you uh, shuffle the cards as much as you want. And uh, what I would probably have you do is think of a card, any card that you want, and then look through the deck and pick it out. Now, you can't really do that, so you just have to assume that maybe you could have thought of this card right here, right? You take that one out, and I would want you to uh, look at it. Of course, you you have it in your mind. Show it to someone else so that we can be fair about this and, and keep everybody honest. Um, and then what I want you to do is just place it back anywhere that you want in the deck. Anywhere that you like. You don't have to square it up. Just put it in there, okay? And I just want to give you one last glimpse to make sure that you, you have the card that you like, okay? We're going to place it back into the deck. And then just to make sure that this is fair, I would have you shuffle the cards again. So you just shuffle the cards any way that you want as much as you want, certainly any way that you want, just so you're satisfied uh, that this has been completely fair. So you thought of a card, right? You shuffled the deck. Um, you did everything. <coughs> There's no way, by the way, I have a cough still. <coughs> Nasty, it won't go away. So you thought of a card, um, you took it out of the deck, and it's been put back in here. There's no way that I could know what it is. I could look at this all day long. There's no way that I could know. We're in an impossible kind of situation here. What I want to talk to you today is about shutting the doors. Okay, shutting the doors. So there is a, um, a, a, a phrase that we use in magic called shutting the doors. Uh, and you'll hear some people lecture on this topic uh, frequently about whenever you are presenting magic, make sure that you shut all of the doors, that there is no explanation available. This was jogged in my mind because I was uh, watching, reading through a, um, uh, a forum post where they were talking about Ethics and magic, it's that post that, you know, the thing that always comes up in discussion in the public magic forums, that what happens when someone sells a secret, you know, what kind of rights can they claim on it? Well, what if you see a performance and then you, you presume to know how it's done? Can you use that method without buying it? That kind of stuff. And I've already talked about this at length, so... I'll try to link that uh, video as quick as I can when I put this one up in the uh, description so you can find that discussion. But it was that comment about watching a performance and figuring out how it was done that caught my attention. Because you, you often get a number of kind of snide comments off of that. The common one is, well, if you figured out how it's done, then it was a bad performance. You know, that kind of thing. I don't think that's true, uh, by the way. And it, it brings me back to this topic of shutting all the doors. So I've heard a lot of magicians talk about this. People that I really admire uh, that have been in the business a very long time talking about making a good effect by shutting all of the doors. This is referring to eliminating every explanation, right? That <clears throat> a good effect needs to eliminate all explanations, and um, really, it's not good until you've done that. You, you, you've you accomplished what what you, you set out to do with your spectators when there is no explanation to what you do. The question I ask is, can you do that? And the answer I give and this is my belief, and I'll explain here, is that no, you can't do that. You can't shut all of the doors. That's not possible. It just isn't possible. Anything that a person can do no matter how amazing it looks, can be explained, not merely in theory, but the explanation for how it is accomplished can be observed in the occurrence. Um, if it can't be observed in the occurrence, then the fact that the potential or absolute explanation has been edited out from viewing is... Part of the explanation. You see right. You see where I'm going. That whenever you watch something done by people, there is an explanation that is in view. It's there to be recognized, uh, and it cannot be eliminated. It's not possible. Can't do it. 
So that brings me to a different question. I don't think it's really about shutting all of the doors. I think the real question is, is what doors are you willing to leave? What, what, what doors present in the moment are you willing to accept to convince your spectators that the impossible has happened? Okay. Um, so let me go through this real quick. Um, shutting all of the doors. I think it's important to shut all of the obvious doors as best you can. That's a good place to start, right? If you have an effect and you have a method um, that you can use to accomplish it, how do you eliminate the method that you're using? How do you shut all of the obvious doors, the obvious explanations for what you're doing? Um, you know, get rid of those. So let's take this little experiment right here. You thought of a card. If you were really here, obviously you didn't think of a card. Uh, you thought of a card, and that shuts one door. It said, I did not force it on you. You thought of it. You examine the deck. You held it in your hand, and you picked the card out, which gives you the opportunity to verify that, to the best of your ability, you can determine this is a normal deck of cards, and you took out a card that you were thinking of. That whole procedure in itself is suspicious, isn't it? Right, because I could have just had you think of a card and not have a deck at all. But there is a deck of cards involved, and there's no revel. Uh, we haven't done anything yet. The trick's not even finished, right? Um, but you you thought of one. You took it out of the deck of cards. The deck seems to be normal. Not only can you think know that the deck is normal because you looked at it, but I didn't look at it. So throughout the entire procedure, the card was thought of removed and replaced, and I did not look at the deck um, from the beginning up until the point where you shuffled it and put it back down. So that's another thing. Another door is you shuffled the cards um, before, during, and after all of this. These are the obvious doors, okay? So what we're doing is shutting the obvious doors. Anything that would be obvious. If, if I had you pick a card, there's a door, right? I could force it. I could see the cards, <coughs> which means that if they could be marked, something like that. If you took the card out freely and put it back in and I shuffled the deck, I could control it. But that's not what happened here, okay? These are the obvious doors that we're closing down. So we're eliminating a force. We're eliminating a peak. We're eliminating the use of gimmicks, as far as most people would know, okay? Um, so number one, shut all of the obvious doors. That's a good place to start. Number two, disguise a door as a wall, right? You're going to have to use a door. You got to get in somehow. One option is to disguise a door as a wall, um, that you take you take the thing that you're using and you make that, you, you kind of point that thing out and you make it appear as if it's not a door at all, as if it's a wall. So one place I'll go, it's unrelated to this, because I'm not sure I'm really doing that with this effect. Um, but um, I was talking earlier about um, the lottery illusion in a previous video and some options there for that. Um, with most lottery type illusions, predictions of that sort, predictions in general, they tend to use this route that you disguise the way that you do it by pointing out that that way is not possible. You, you present that as a, an impossibility. So if I have some sort of an equivocate force down to multiple outs, what I'm doing is I'm disguising the explanation that you have been pigeonholed, forced into a corner by expressing through the equivocate that you had a choice, right? Forces do this. So uh, the use of a force of, of most any kind kind of accomplishes this. Um, 
you know, that that's that's a way to do it. So one, shut all of the obvious doors. Two, um, use uh, uh, disguise the door you use as a wall. Try to eliminate the door you're actually using as presenting it in a different light. Three, and this is where professionals really thrive. When you have a stage show, a parlor act, something that you're doing uh, with regularity, it's been well designed and it's in a very controlled environment, um, use the most outlandish entry that you can get. So rather than shutting all of the doors, you shut the obvious doors, you, you disguise the door, whatever. But what you want to do is actually disguise the craziest door that there is. Okay. So how, how does this work? Well, you got to get in somehow, but what if you go in through the window on the third floor in the back? Crazy, right? The window's only this big and you can kind of weasel your way into it. Now, I do want to point out though, that this approach does not mean that it has to be difficult. That's not it. It just has to be outlandish. It has to be absurd, right? Whatever the solution is, it needs to be really, really silly and outside of the imagination of the viewer. When I think of this, this is where I go, right? This is, this is the best example of that that I can think of now as magicians. We think this is such a common piece of apparatus, right? The thumb tip. This is totally outlandish. This is absurd. I mean, this is really quite, quite crazy. Um, you know, I've heard people do coin magic and spectators will say, well, you've got a pocket in your skin. Well, that's what this is. That's exactly what this is. They say that because it's just so crazy and absurd and it can't possibly be true, but can it be, right? So use the most outlandish entryway as your entryway. Use, use the door that is nobody would think about, right? That's, that's one way to do it. Um, <clears throat> and then the last thing is avoid using the only possible entry, right? However outlandish. You could be using the most outlandish entry, but if it's the only possible one, you have a problem. And this gets into the two perfect theory. And there's so much disagreement and argument on this subject. I've talked about it before. The, the two perfect th theory is not merely a theory. It, it really is a real thing. And this is what we're talking about. If you, if, you, if you end up using the only way in, no matter how crazy and outlandish, but it is everything has been eliminated down to that, you have an issue because the solution is that. Um, and this is not this is not new, and this is not nothing that can really be dealt with other than by having kind of more possibilities in that one. Uh, Arthur Conan Doyle, right, in his his character Sherlock Holmes, right, he uses the he uses that that uh, that phrase. Right. Uh, uh, when you have eliminated all which is impossible, then whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. That's it. That is the two perfect theory in a nutshell. That's it right there. Um, and magicians do this sometimes. So you really do have to consider that when you're coming up with a method that that I don't, I don't think you really have to overtly create false, you know, red herrings. I don't think you have to create false solutions. I just think you have to be very careful that you don't explain your trick by leaving one out, you know, at the end of your display of shutting all the doors, right? I think you need to, you need to shut all of the doors, but within reason, uh, such that you don't essentially tell the audience exactly what door you're going through even if it's insane, right? So um, that's pretty much the talk. So with all of that, right, you were thinking of the Ace of Diamonds. That's it, right? Uh, the Ace of Diamonds was the card that you were thinking of, and, and all the doors are shut there. And, and in this case, what we're using is, um, you know, we're using an outlandish entryway. Um, 
And by the way, let me talk about the outlandish entryway. Sometimes the best way to use the most outlandish entry, the most absurd entryway, the, the door that isn't even a door, but it is, an, it is a hole in the wall, right, is not by merely picking one that's open, but finding a way to get to it where otherwise it looks like it's not achievable. If you're using the small window on the third floor in the back, well, you also need to have the, um, <coughs> the ivy lattice that's sitting four feet to the left, right? Nobody thinks about getting into the structure through the lattice work, but if I can climb the lattice work and I can reach over and I can get into the window, then I've gotten in, right? So you, one, one way to do this is to have multiple steps taking the long way around to get in there. It, think of it like this. A good method often is, instead of trying to go from point A to point B, right, is going from point A, it's money laundering, right? What I'm going to describe here is money laundering. This is it, right? You're pinging off of different places to get back here. So rather going from point A to point B, going from point A to point Z to point Q to point J, Maybe back to point A once or twice, and then over here, and then finally ending up here. So you have a, a, a very arduous kind of tracking that's going on. And the more outlandish all these other points are, the harder it is for the spectator to see. What we're looking at here is not shutting all of the doors. What we really are talking about is leaving a bunch of doors open, but we're just using, we're deciding to fixate on the most kind of out-of-the-box ways to get there. We're taking the extreme scenic route. Instead of shutting all the doors and saying, well, I want to get rid of this scenic route, this one, this one here, and I want to point them out to you and make sure that you can see all of them, and then leaving really the only point A to B answer left, okay? That's the two perfect problem. That's it right there. Um, so what what's going on here, right? We have We have an outlandish solution. The doors that are open are the fact that I touch the cards. What can that mean if I have the spectator shuffle the deck? Well, to a spectator, it means nothing, the fact that I have the cards. When I give them the, the deck to shuffle after the card is placed in there and I'm not looking at it, what I'm doing is shutting that door. I can't control what I don't have control over. So as they shuffle the cards, I've now shut the door. What they don't know is that I'm using a more outlandish opening that did rely on me handling the cards. There is a control uh, in play here, right? But I've disguised my door as a wall, uh, my outlandish entry, by giving the cards back to them and having them shuffle, right? Then I get the cards back, and obviously what's happened here is the card has been, uh, the card has been identified in that short moment when I had it, right? Spectators don't know about a crimp. They don't know about the fact that a card can be bent and found again. And they don't, even a lot of magicians avoid crimps because they think that crimps ruin cards. Crimping is something you, would want, you wouldn't want to do. It's furthest from the mind of any spectator that you would bend a card to find it. Um, on top of that, uh, that you would bend a card and not just look at it, but rather bend a card and get it situated so that you can get a peek without spreading, right? If I don't spread the cards and take a direct look at them, that, that's another door that's shut. Um, and it just so happens that in this one, as the cards were given back after the shuffle, the crimp ended up on the bottom, and I got my glimpse really easy. I took advantage of another, you know, uh, another access to my window uh, that just presented in the moment. So... So that's it right there, okay? So shutting all of the doors is very, very important, but I don't think that you really ever can do that. The real question is, in my opinion, what door are you willing to leave open? That's your, that's your conundrum. That's your problem. That's the, that's the problem you're trying to solve. How do I want to get in there? Um, it's going to be on full display. It's going to be out in the open, but how am I going to manage the audience expectations so that that door can be accessible to me so that I don't shut it? I can't really shut it. I have to leave it open. Otherwise, I can't do the trick. Okay, shutting all the doors. Interesting. So um, go ahead and uh, uh, 
uh, you know, put your comments below um, and, uh, and let me know what you think. Further discussion on this, um, we see this in magic all the time. I, I remember Copperfield had his uh, 13 illusion, if you remember that whole thing that happened a number of years ago. It is a stage illusion that he did for his uh, TV performances years and years ago, and it was a major point in his act. It was kind of the the closing piece to his show for quite some time, where he'd bring up uh, 13 people from the audience, <clears throat> put them into an enclosure, and they would disappear, and then they would show up in the back of the audience, right? And there, something happened. Somebody got injured, a spectator, and there was a lawsuit, and... You ended up seeing this very grotesque kind of thing on on the news where Chris Kenner, who is, you know, a great magician in his own right, was uh, uh, a consultant manager for Copperfield, still is as far as I know, um, and was he helped develop the illusion. So he was there giving testimony about how the illusion was done in court. To handle this lawsuit uh, to the point where even Copperfield, I think, had to show up and he had to talk about it in the open. And um, the thing about this, I know people really f threw a fit about making a magician come and reveal a secret when there were other ways to go about this. You know, they could have done this in a closed session and talked to the judge could have gotten the testimony directly as the judge was adjudicating. They were, ar you know, they were the arbiter in this. I don't think it was a jury trial of any kind. Um, you know, why would they do this out in the open? And people really kind of threw a fit. And I agree with that. That shouldn't have been done. It just wasn't, I don't think it sets any kind of important precedent. I don't want to make this too, like I said in one of the previous videos, it gets kind of very Tiger King-like, right? We don't need to make a big deal out of this as if this destroys magic forever. Um, but I get that. But at the same time, like this is a stage illusion. The doors weren't all shut. Right. You know how in general, I think the, the normal thinking person essentially knows what's going on with this trick. It's not it's about the spectacle. Copperfield is deciding what door is he going to leave open to, to do this big epic thing. Right. And the door that's left open is obviously that the people have to get from there and they have to get back there. And that's the answer. Right. They're going through some venue that is open and they're doing that. That's the answer to the illusion. That's the door that's left open. It's not a bad trick. It's actually one of the great stage illusions of our time. Um, and some of the doors are closed, but something has to be left open. That's the question. How do you manage the entryway that makes it work? What are you willing to accept to make it work? Because there has to be something. You can't shut everything. And if you try to shut everything and you isolate the one way in, you've made the trick worse. Right? Too perfect. So anyway, comments below. Happy magicking.